doesn't get really excited to shout a lot, so I'm just going to sit here and shout about automation for the next 45 minutes. I know that I'm all sitting between you and sweet, sweet freedom, and freedom apparently tastes like curry. The rumors are true, and delicious British beer. So bear with me a little bit longer, and uh, let's enjoy some discussion about sweet, sweet automation. So at Facebook, everything we do just takes longer because it's just bigger and harder. And all the things I thought were easy are now actually really hard because when I have to do it a lot of times in a row, uh, doing it by hand just doesn't work anymore. So the general rule from thumb for pretty much everything that we do at Facebook now is just automate everything. Literally everything that you do uh, should never be done by hand anymore. My argument for this entire presentation is that you should never do anything by hand. You shouldn't even use the mouse. I don't even want to see you turn on your computer ever again. <laughs> the, the core behind this is the idea that most of what you do can be automated, and the things that you automate can be done programmatically in scripts with tools that you write. You can develop ways to save yourself time, get flexibility, and you do that by storing all the stuff that you do in source control. Tom was talking about it earlier, Tom was talking earlier in his talk, it's been mentioned a few times throughout this, uh, throughout this conference that source control is a real huge key to being able to go back in time, address change management, to be able to store all your data in a safe place, and to come back and be able to reproduce the same results over and over without the possibility of human error. So I'm using this little icon here on my slides to indicate you should use source control to solve this problem. Generally speaking, when we are deploying Macs, we have the same common approach to pretty much all of our Mac deployment, right? We all have to put some kind of base OS there, we have to install the software on it, and then there's usually some kind of special customization that we apply to our users. Um, that might involve things like data tool and X, that might involve user-specific software, any custom setup scripts that your organization might want to use. Um, but one way or another, we all tend to go through the same basic process. And the same thing happens with our general common Mac admin operations. We all tend to do the same kind of things. We use auto package to import things in a monkey. If you're not using auto package, man, <laughs> kill me. Don't do that. You're, gonna hurt, you're just going to hurt yourself this way. Okay. We have to set up deployment servers. We have to figure out how we're actually going to get the stuff we want onto the max. And we have to build out our tool chains. That's things like you got to make your images if you're still doing imaging. You gotta make your workflows for things like Deploy Studio and Imager and Casper. You gotta set up your monkey manifests. You have to set up your MDM policies. Those are all the, the tool chains that we have to manage on a regular basis. And of course, you have to test, right? You have to make sure you're not deploying stuff straight into production without ever giving a chance to make sure it actually isn't gonna break and destroy your fleet first. So let's talk about some of these common tools that we use. Okay, auto package. Auto package looks pretty familiar to most people who've gone through it. You go through the setup page first, right? You all start the getting started page. You look at the wiki. You ask some questions in Slack. You read some blog posts. Makes sense. You get it figured out. You install it on your Mac. Cool. Great. Now, you hire another person who's going to join your team. They need to do the same thing. Hey, I got to set up auto package. What do I do? Go to the wiki. Don't go to the wiki. <laughs> you go to the wiki the first time when you learn how it works. After that, what you should do is you should automate this process. You should have a defined protocol for how do I get a machine capable of running auto package in my environment to work with our setup. If you have to do it by hand any more than one time, you have a problem, right? What happens if the one guy who set up auto package leaves the company? The one guy who knows how to import things into the repo just disappears one day. Just poof. What happens? You got to do it all over again, right? So what I'm saying to you is, don't go to the wiki every time you need to figure it out. Go to the wiki once, write down what you need to do, make these steps, and let's automate this process. Tom Bridge, I'll mention him again, has a nice tool that does things like this. <laughs> this is a great example of the kind of tooling I'm talking about. Write tools, write scripts, use other people's resources for things that do this process for you. This is a script you just run, and it's a repeatable script. It works the same way every time. It performs some actions based on some variables. By just running the script over and over again, you're going to get the same result. When you do it by hand as a human being, let me tell you, I've screwed up a whole lot of things many times in a row. I don't like doing that because then these guys make fun of me for it. So don't screw things up. Do it in the script. Think about the actual things that need to happen when you're running auto package, when you're setting up auto package. You need to install the package, 
set up all your preferences. You need to set up access to your, uh, your monkey or JSS repo. You need to clone all the recipe repos that you want to use, make all your overrides show up, and then set your recipe list. And then on your general day-to-day -day practice, you do your auto package run, you know, list of recipes, and you get your results. This process is actually really simple. You break down to the basic idea of actions and variables. You have some basic actions you'll always take. These are things you're always going to do when you set up auto package. Variables are the things that change. What recipes you're using, what repos you need, where your access to your own monkey or JSS repo are. So when you're running auto package, the process is again, is very straightforward. You are installing the release package. You repo add all the repos you need. You configure your preferences. The data that you're consuming, just like I said, the preferences, the recipes, the repo names, and the things you need. So when you're running auto package directly, you run the recipe, you upload that binary into your repo, whether you do that through file share or anything else like that, you make catalogs, and then you have gold, right? You just run auto package, you get a package info, you get your binary, upload it to monkey, you're awesome. That whole thing, all those steps can be automated. This is what it usually looks like if you use source control with Monkey, right? You usually do something like this. You run your recipe, you make your catalogs, add them to git, make your commit, push it upstream. Don't do that. And I'll tell you why. Because you could do that instead in a one-line command. You could use some kind of wrapper that takes all these common operations that you do over and over and over again and automate them. You're going to automate your automation tools. And the reason why is because, again, it's a process. Everything that you do is part of a process that you run. And these processes can be combined and made into simpler processes that can be abstracted out. So that when you're trying to introduce a new person to understand this process, it's much easier for someone else to get into. We introduced a tool that I use called Auto Package Tools, which uh, is our wrapper script around Auto Package that basically does all this for us. The idea is that. I found myself constantly running auto package, running git, making, uploading all the stuff, pushing the commit up, things like that. Those are several steps that I want to combine into one set of tools. And I want to make it kind of foolproof. Because if I'm trying to teach someone how to do this process, and they're unfamiliar with git, or they don't have a lot of experience with a general process in general, there's a lot of room for error there. How many of you have started playing with git and gotten yourself into a deep, horrible Git hell. Yeah, oh, we, yeah, yeah, we've been there, right? We've all been in Git rebase hell, and there's just no way out of that. So rather than possibly introducing a new person into the seventh circle of hell with Git, which might be an initiation tactic, I mean, I'm not saying, you know, we kind of have anti-hazy rules here, so let's, you know, go to conduct, right? But in order to reduce the amount of time that things are going to possibly go wrong when you just want to run something simple as an auto packet recipe, wrap it up. Develop your own tool, or use one of ours, or use someone else's resource that does some of these things for you. So when you're writing this automation tool, right, the same general theme comes by. You have data that you consume and actions you perform. The actions generally don't change. You always have to do the same general things. But the data that you're using are the things that you want to actually change on a regular basis based on your environment's needs. You put the list of recipes you need in some kind of file. Your runner looks at this file and then runs these recipes. You're good to go. The same kind of rules apply to Monkey, right? With Monkey, you have to set up your server. You have to often set up more servers if your company starts to scale upwards quite a bit. And then you've got to manage your source control. One of Monkey's great strengths is that the web server is just dumb. All it does is serve static files. It's just a dumb web server running Apache or Nginx or, you know, if you're weird going on like light HTTP or something like that. Doesn't matter. It's all just a single static web server serving out dumb files. Cool. This is what most people do when they're setting up their first monkey server. They go to the demonstration setup. They go to the set of instructions, make their own test server. They get Firefox in there. They get really excited when their first VM actually works. Yeah, I love monkey. It's great. And then you know you start scaling out outwards. You get big servers. You're running Linux and CentOS servers. And then the next day, your boss comes up and says, all right, we just hired 6,000 more people. We're going to need more monkey servers. They're like, cool. I'm on it. I'll go here. <laughs> Don't go here. Same rules apply, right? Don't use a hand 
process, a, a single person's knowledge to be the only way that you're going to set up these kind of things. Automate the knowledge that you need to keep going. This way, if you ever get hit by a bus, or you win the lottery, or you eat a little bit too much curry tonight, you drink a little too much beer, your passport gets revoked, you can't go home, and you're like, well, I'm just living in Britain most of my life. Cool. Your company's kind of screwed now, because now somebody else has to go through this wiki. Don't make them go through the wiki. Instead, you should have some kind of script, some kind of tooling, like monkey in a box, which helps you set up a monkey server in an automated way. You get the same result every time. It's a repeatable process. The good news is that web servers are, in a lot of ways, kind of a solved problem. Everyone, at some point in their life, has probably had to deal with setting up a web server. There's lots of documentation on it. Almost every config management system out there is capable of setting up a web server. So for the most part, it's not that hard for you to write some kind of automation tool to do that part for you. If you know that, hey, my boss is going to hire 6,000 more people tomorrow, right? you want to be able to scale horizontally as fast as possible, with as little turnaround as you can. And that's where automation tools like that really come into play. When you have source control as the, the foundation for all this, it's real simple, right? Making a new server, you clone your repo, which has your manifests, your package infos, you sync out your binaries from wherever that might be. Maybe it's as simple as just R syncing from server to server. Maybe you have an SMB share. Maybe you feel like being a masochist and using Git fat. There's all kinds of cool things that you can do, right? <laughs> then you just got to run your web server script. And guess what? You have a new monkey server. Spinning up a new monkey server now becomes a trivial task. All you got to do is argue endlessly about the hardware for the next you know, six weeks for someone to actually pay for it. That's not your problem, though. Your problem is getting the software installed. Once you get that hardware, you run this. And when you have things like control, when you have control over things like the OS you're using, or you know, the actual shape of the hardware you're using, when you get to control the variables you have to worry about, these kind of status scripts become really robust, because you know you're going to get the same result every single time. I'm talking too fast. I'm so sorry. When you store your monkey repo in source control, right? this gives you all kinds of free benefits. For one thing, you get auditing, you get reports, you get change management for free. You get the reduction of human error, because you don't have to worry about somebody remembering what steps do I take to install Apache? How did I set up that monkey server that first time? I don't remember. Do you remember? Don't have to worry about that anymore. It's all stored in source control for you. You also get free benefits as a disaster recovery. I have a confession to make. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this is actually really recent, too. I've been managing monkey for many, many years now. And I was like, OK, guys, I have this really cool idea. To, to enhance the way that our monkey server works, uh, I need to do this test. And we only have, I need to do it on the server where we actually have all the data already ready. So I'm going to take one of our monkey servers out of the DNS pool. So no clients are going to connect to it. And I'll just run it on this live server with no clients. It should be fine. And everything's going to be great. I ran this test. We found out that the share that it pulls all the monkey code from was read write, not read only. And uh, I had a logic error. My logic error replaced the entire monkey repo with a symlink to itself that went nowhere. <laughs> All gone. And so someone walks over and is like, hey, I'm, I'm trying to use Managed Software Center. Uh, it's just sitting here spinning. That's weird. What's going on here? Wait, where are the catalogs? Wait, where's the repo? Guys, I, uh, I made it bad. <laughs> yeah, I deleted the repo on a live server of our largest data center for all of production. Good news is that with source control, coming back was easy, right? We just recall the repo. We resynced all the binaries down. We had it back up 45 minutes. So my teammates sat there applauding me for 45 minutes straight, and then I don't even swat after that. So a little embarrassing. So what I'm saying is, again, source control fixes things like this, right? In your day-to-day -day operations for Monkey, don't do what I did. Don't edit things live on a server. How many of you open up Monkey Admin, make your changes, YOLO, straight to prod? <laughs> Come on, confess. You've all done it before at least once. Yeah, we've all been there. I used to work in education, right? And education is like the definition of YOLOing things. It's like, whatever, there's like 600 people. Who else did I have twos? You know, it doesn't matter. Uh, I was at things in prod. Oh, you know, I broke the student lab for like 24 hours. Whatever. They'll figure it out. I'll just go back to using Adobe software. <laughs> all right, so. Source control, still, no matter what your scale is, 
kind of helps mitigate these kind of issues. It prevents people like me from coming along and yoloing in your repo lives. <laughs> so you've got, like I said, you've got audit and you have peer review, right? You have the possibility of, okay, I want to make a change to the repo. Before I do something incredibly stupid, Greg, will you check my logic to make sure I'm not going to replace the cutting the sim link? And then Greg's like, oh, sure, yeah, YOLO, accept it. And then that's <laughs> by anyway. But at least that way it's someone else's fault, right? So client side, the process is pretty simple. You clone the repo, you make sure you have your local access to monkey, you run the auto package wrapper, and this gives me a commit that contains my package info, and it uploads the binary directly to our binary storage. And then the diff goes up for review. Somebody else on my team now has to look through that, you know, look at the code, look at the package info, make sure it looks sane, basic sanity check. Someone else's eyes were on that. So now if everything breaks, now it's two of our faults. So again, real simple, right? One line gives me all that. And on the server side, we use source control again. We just pull from Git on a regular interval. We say, hey, all right, any changes yet? Any changes now? How about now? And so we get changes, we generate new catalogs. Okay, well, I just updated a new file. Let's run the catalogs again. That way, clients always have the latest stuff. And then we just sync up the binaries whenever we have updates to that. Real simple. The best part about this is that this has allowed us at Facebook to open up Monkey to other people. One of the issues we've long had is that we were the gatekeepers for all of Monkey access. In order to get anything updated in MSC, teams had to say, hey, hey, Nick, can you upload this stuff for me? That was cool, until people started finding out. Oh, hey, this guy, if I yell at him enough times in a row, he'll just give in and update my software for me. And we have a lot of internal teams at Facebook developing software that want to put into the monkey repo. I'm like, that's a great idea. I love to serve all your stuff through MSC. Oh my god, leave me alone, right? So I want to let them, on their own, update stuff to the repo without my help. I want to let teams who design their own software put stuff in here. And you know how they do it now? They run the auto package command. That's all it takes. They don't have to learn how Monkey works. They don't have to learn to a great extent how Git works. They just need to know, how do I run this tool? How do I submit a diff? What do I do when it's reviewed? And then they don't require any kind of direct access to the repo. They don't require any direct access to any of the live servers. So the chance of someone else yellowing, that's my privilege. I work here. I can break the repo if I want to, not you. The same rules, again, apply to when you're doing deployment. When you're doing app deployment, you've got to have the same basic ideas. You've got your MBI creation if you're doing netboot. You've got to build your images. You've got to set up your workflows. All of this, again, is a series of actions and data. Actions like you've got to install the deploy studio. You've got to create your workflow, which are just B lists. You've got to copy in your binaries, your scripts, your set up your preferences, and then you just got to start the service. This is how you set up the deploy studio. The data that you consume. What do my workflows do? What, what package do I, do I need to sync? What are the preferences for Deploy Studio? How does it run? What port does it run on? Is it using SSL? Sorry, is it using TLS? Things like that. Again, data and actions. Netboot is also easy to script, easy to manage. You can generate Netboot images through a lot of different ways. I'm a big fan of uh, Per Olufsen's Auto DSNBI. We have a fork of that, and all this will be available online. These are all clickable links, and I'll have references at the end, so you don't need to worry too much about copying URLs. AutoDS NBI lets you script the process of going to Deploy Studio Assistant, doing create a netboot set, clicking through all the dialog boxes, setting up all your settings. That can all be done by feeding in variables into the script. Then you run the script, you get a result. So what we do here at Facebook is we have, I have on all my imaging servers a script that just runs this on a nightly basis. Oh, has there been a system update? Cool. Let's build a new MBI. Let's make sure the MBI is built the same way every time. That's done by Chef with us. Auto MBI and Auto Casper MBI are tools that give you very similar results. If you use Imager or if you use Casper Imaging, does anyone use Casper Imaging? Anybody here? How's that working out for you? <laughs> Carry on, sir. You're a brave man. But what I'm saying again, even if you, no matter what tool you use. You should find a way to avoid ever having to use the mouse. You should find a way to avoid ever having to do anything by hand or having to explain to somebody else what it was you did. What I realized when I was trying to help a field tech in Singapore who was on a 14-hour time zone difference how to get this new imaging server set up, 
like the more I sit here and try to describe what you should be looking at in this like deploy studio assistant window, the more I want to shoot myself, right? This is terrible. <laughs> trying to lead someone through the process of building a deploy studio NPI screen by screen. No, no, click on this field. Does it look like HTTPS? Calls it none. Okay. Right? That, that's terrible. Don't do that. Use scripts. Build things. Serving out NBIs, right? You have to, once you build your network image, you've got to serve it with something. Well, traditionally, people actually use server.app. Uh, thanks to Papine, we have tools like BSDPY, which is an open source uh, netboot serving system. Server.app, we all love, hate server.app. It's there. We're kind of stuck with it in some cases. Actually, despite all evidence, can be scripted and automated. I know this is the upsetting. <laughs> Most people, you open up server.app for the first time, I'm like, okay, I got this. Don't do that. Okay? <laughs> all this process of going through server.app, again, you can avoid ever having to look at this thing. I don't want to see this window ever again. I just want to throw up when I look at this window. Instead, I want to do something cool. I want to use this command line, like server setup, and I want to use this cool feature called expect, which is where you break all the things you know about bash. And I want to use this to set up server.app for myself. And you can also use the built-in server admin tool, which also comes for free when you install server.app, to actually manage your services. You can use it to manage your preferences, set your settings, start and stop services. So all of this stuff can be done without ever having to access a GUI. Some very brilliant person on Jamf Nation one day found, hey, you can actually get past that first time server uh, license accept window, which you have, to, you, know, you have to hit the button, accept, and then has to go through that setup process. You can skip all that. Apple finally provided this neat little tool, server setup, to get past that for you. Then Rich Trouton found that and ran with it. <laughs> Made a blog post, hey, here's a nice little batch script you can use to completely automate that process. Mm -hmm. That's good. You've now gotten past uh, uh, basically what amounts to a GUI blocking stage to be able to automate the complete setup, top to bottom, headlessly of a new imaging server using server.app. Cool. I took this. I ran with it. I now have a chef cookbook that does all this for me, right? It uses Python and pexpect rather than bash and expect. But it, if you've got server.app installed, it will accept your license. It will set up all the tools you want. Uh, if you were in Nate's session earlier, you kind of saw the idea that we have of abstracting all the stuff out to a series of variables, a series of attributes. You set up the services you want. I want Netboot to run with this name. I want to serve this index. I want to do this thing. I want the service to be enabled. All that can be done. All we got to do to set up a new imaging server at Facebook now is you get me a Mac, and you give it a certain host name, you install Chef, 24 hours later, It'll be serving out a brand new, fresh image and an NBI, hands off. That's the whole idea, right? You want to completely automate these complicated processes because I do not want to sit there and be called at three in the morning from Hyderabad, from Singapore, from Sydney, from time zones I don't even, you know, time zones I don't want to be in at any time of day or night because hey, I need an imaging server right now. What do I do? Yeah, okay, I can document. I can make a nice little wiki with screenshots and instructions, but we all know the truth. If you write a wiki, someone is going to very determinedly not read it. <laughs> They're going to very aggressively ignore all your instructions and call you anyway, saying, I followed your instructions and it didn't work. Right? So all of this process, take out the human error a part of it. Take out the human interaction of it. Automate it. If you're using images, now I know, let's have a moment of silence for imaging being dead, despite imaging being horribly dead. Seems to work just fine for us. We've been doing it for a really long time. I'm going to keep doing it until Apple tells me no. Please don't take images away. <laughs> you can build images, again, without ever having to touch the mouse. AutoDMG is a wonderful tool. Another tool by Per Allison. I love it. I wish I could marry it. This tool just solves all of my problems all at once. And you can do it purely by command line. Don't use the GUI. I mean, it's a great GUI. You did a really good job. Don't get me wrong. I mean, this is a fantastic tool. I think everybody should use it. But what I'm saying is, do it by command line, right? There's a whole wiki page on how you can automate and manage the building of new images. And you can do all that very easily. You just run the commands, you pass in the arguments, voila, fresh image. If you're imaging and you're using Monkey, then it's even easier. 
because you can use our nice little tool called AutoDMD Cache Builder, which is a nice little tool that I wrote that solves most of our problems. The idea behind AutoDMD Cache Builder is that it preloads all the things in your monkey manifest into the image in a safe, as safe way as possible. For things that cannot be safely installed in the image, things that may have post-flight scripts or complicated actions or things that have to run in a user's context, instead, those all get put into the monkey cache directly. So when your monkey bootstrap triggers after a machine's been imaged, all of those files are already downloaded. This is a huge, huge time savings if you have a lot of stuff that you're installing during your bootstrap. I'm really happy with this tool. I spent a lot of time on this. Please don't kill imaging. It's all useless. <laughs> so one of the benefits of using this approach is that we have kind of dynamic thick imaging, right? So thin imaging has been kind of the way of the game for a long time now. The idea being that you want to lay down your, your base OS, which is basically a bare, up-to-date, never booted system. And then you want to put all your stuff on top of it. You want to use Monkey or Casper or some tool to lay all of your software and your settings onto your base image afterwards. This gives you the speed of putting an OS from a, a, a restore, and you get the flexibility of being able to customize your, uh, your install experience at any, at any given time. You kind of get the best of both worlds when you use ADCB because we can automate these builds nightly. Every night, every single one of our 60 plus imaging servers builds a new image. It gets the latest updates from Man Software Center, puts as much as it can into the image, and then things that can't go into the image get put into the cache. That way, when the machine boots for the very first time after an image restore, it only has no downloading to do, only installation to do. This, like I said, has been a huge time savings. Our image right now with ADCB built, which now includes two different copies of Xcode, the entire Android SDK, the entire Android negative development kit, IntelliJ, all the Android development tools, three different text editors, and a partridge in a pear tree. Now, 27 gigs, that actual image restore process, I mean the full block, Copy restore takes you know on a Mac Pro like four minutes or so. So that's four minutes to get 27 gigs of that data onto the machine. Most of that software is now pre-installed. What has to happen on the first monkey bootstrap? It installs about six things. A few things that can't be safely put into the image. Uh, BombGuard, for example, which is BombGuard is a useful tool, but deploying it is like the tool of the devil. They, they, they fear packages. They fear deployment. They must avoid it at all costs and make everything as hard for you as possible. Sucks deployment. Things like that all have to go into the image after deployment because they just can't be safely installed into a never booted DMD before. When you preload all this stuff into this directory, into the monkey cache directory, my full deployment, meaning from the time that some tech holds down the letter N and net boots, the first time a user can log in and all the setup is done is under 20 minutes per machine in ideal circumstances, right? When we're going through 80 a week, 120 a week, during the height of intern season, we got to crank through close to 800 in two weeks. Speed matters a lot at that volume. Speed is our most important consideration. So if speed is what matters to you, this is a really helpful way of doing it. And again, I don't ever have to build manual images. One of the problems that I inherited when I first started is that we had a system where we had imaging servers all over the world that were all syncing. We had Deploy Studio syncs and replicas set up left and right. How many of you have ever suffered greatly at the end of Deploy Studio Sync? Yeah, I'm sorry. It's terrible. It's a great idea when you've got you know, one or two devices, one or two servers. When you're trying to scale across the world, across different time zones, this was a nightmare. Because we'd make one change in Pacific Standard Time at 3 p.m. That wouldn't sync until about midnight Pacific Time. But if we made a change that depended upon this stuff being in the image, by the next day, that night when Singapore wakes up, they're past the time of sinking. They're not going to get it for another 30 hours. And so we just kept running the issues where we would have hit our own race conditions. We were in a race against ourselves and we kept losing. I kept losing a race with one person in it. It's terrible, <laughs> right? So I don't want to keep doing that. So I don't want to use sinking. I don't want to have to worry about things like time zones ever ruining my life again. Because they kept doing that. People kept calling me at 3 in the morning saying, Nick, the image doesn't work anymore. It's 3 in the morning. Can this wait till tomorrow? No, it can't. Everything's critical. So you build these things <laughs> locally on each imaging server. You automate this process completely. I don't have to touch it anymore. No one does. 
something goes wrong, what I tell the text, oh, okay, this SSHN, you run this one command, rebuild the image, rebuild the NVI. When we gotta put updates on there, all I gotta do is tell anybody on my team, hey, I need you to run this one monkey update. Can you just run this auto package tools command? All done. And the, tool, the teams that design their own software to go into the repo now have their own control over their own update schedule. They don't have to ask me when things go into the repo. They just do it, and it just works. So they don't have to understand monkey or git or any of that stuff. The summary, involving me shouting at you for 20 minutes. <laughs> Implement your tools, right? Do it right the first time. Document your process really thoroughly. Make sure you understand what you did to get there. Reproduce it. Reproduce it as precisely and carefully as you can. Design your tools in a way that it's easy to make changes without having to fun fundamentally change your code. Consume variables that your actions then use. Implement your, your tools, automate it as best you can, and then never touch it. And when I say never, I don't mean ignore, I mean maintain it, but don't fiddle. You know, you shouldn't ever have to keep fiddling with all your critical infrastructure. If it's that critical, then it should be done by a process that you can control. That's it. Yeah, um, all these applicable links, and so when I, I'll, I'll, the slides will be available. You can do the references for all this. Nearly all the code that we use to manage this is all open source. We've published nearly all of this on Facebook's IPCP GitHub page. Uh, I've written some blog posts about several of these. There are many people in the audience who have contributed a lot of the tools that we use here. This is one of the most part of this community, is that this is all open to share. So I encourage every one of you, if you've got a situation where you've got to be able to replicate your kind of critical infrastructure, don't do it by hand. Find tools like this, or write your own, and share them back. Because someone out there probably has a similar setup and will thank you heavenly someday in the future. Maybe over curd, maybe over beer. Thanks. So this is one of those places where I get to ask a question, hoping you're going to tell me the right answer. Um, because I have no idea what the best way is to start down the garden path of, uh, of moving multiple repos into one kind of sane Git environment. Because we have so many different clients and so many different servers. I'd love to create like a master catalog that is our, the equivalent of our site default for all of our clients. And um, do you have any good guidance on how to handle that? The best way to start any of projects like this is to start small, right? You, you do one at a time. I mean, as, as actually in your own presentation, you give a great example of this, where uh, don't move everything all at once to a new platform. Don't make all of your changes all across the board all at one time. Piecemeal. Make a repo, move it over to Git, see, how, see what the process is like for you and your clients to interact with this repo through source control, rather than the previous methods you might have been using Use Git, use you know whatever source control method you prefer to sort of change your workflow a bit. Does that workflow make sense? Does it make it easier? Are there benefits to it? And of course, the first rule of disaster recovery has to be actually restored, right? You don't actually have a backup until you've actually tried to restore it, as GitLab found out very recently. God rest their souls. Um, so, you know, when you have a situation where you're managing lots of different micropos across lots of different clients, do it piecemeal. Try one process and see if that works for you. Because as you, as, as, as you make it an iterative process, you can sort of learn what works, what doesn't work, and how you can adapt your environments to meet your needs better. Um, so general rule, like, like obviate all this stuff, but be very methodical and very precise with it. Don't YOLO, because I YOLO'd and it was terrible, and they had to stop laughing at me for it. No, it's not hardware specific. It's, it's OS build specific, right? So the idea, so Apple has made a sudden change that made all of us very, very happy, where now they are posting a new version of the App Store same day as they release updates. When 10.12.3 came out, the App Store installer for Sierra was now 10.12.3, same day. Historically, it's taken them days, <laughs> weeks before that actually happened, but if they're gonna keep this habit up, now you now, you now have a, 
source for building new NVIs and building new images out of. You download this NV, you download the Sierra installer, you copy it into a VM or whatever your target machine is, you get that machine up to date, you use that as your source to build an NVI. Right now, 10.12.3 is a unified build. All current Macs will work on 10.12.3. That's great. That might not be true in the future. Anytime Apple releases new hardware, there's always kind of a random chance that they're going to make a forced build, which will make things difficult. At that point, you will have to install, excuse me, you'll have to build your NVI on this forced build machine. So that's something you'll have to incorporate into your workflow. Thankfully, that seems to be becoming more and more rare. Um, forced builds haven't lasted as long in the last like two years or so as they have in the last five years. So ideally, Apple will continue to kind of mitigate the impact of forced builds like that. So for the most part, as long as you have any machine running that latest OS build, you'll generally be okay. So it, common myth is that it's based on hardware, but it's actually just based on the OS that it comes from. And typically that means the newest hardware will generally have the newest OS, which is why that tends to correlate. Uh, have you thought about automating your peer review process in any way? Uh, everyone did great. Go home. <laughs> <laughs> or everyone's terrible. And everything's terrible. Um, I mean, copy and paste works out pretty great. Uh, no. Um, <laughs> well, yeah. I've, I've been playing around a little bit with, um, with Travis CI uh, mm -hmm. and using that with an auto package repo to, to check certain things like. Uh, if it's a monkey <coughs> recipe, it has a description, it has a... Uh, right, yeah, I see It has the catalog you're expecting it to, for it to go. I did, uh, so so one of the things that our, our other development teams asked for, like, okay, how do we know if what we generate is going to be good, right? We, we, I, so I write this tool, I have this package info, and I have this binary, like, how do I know it's actually going to work? Like, and, and the process of setting up a monkey testing repo for them to try out and they're trying to VM, that's a complicated process for a software developer or a designer who's not used to systems management. So in order to make it easier for them, I, I wrote a linter. Uh, I have a linter that every time you try to make a diff, uh, you send up a commit into the repo with your new package info, it just checks the package for basic sanity. Are you using one of the catalogs that we use? Do you have a description, a category, a developer? Do you have an icon? Uh, does it pass a basic key list lint check? You know, do you have a sane XML document? So my, my claim now is that as long as you meet this basic sanity standard, uh, it's good for me, right? And if, if it doesn't work, if you upload a, a new version of some internal tool and you it's not installing or clients can't use it, at that point, that's on their team to fix, right? Our service, the service of Monkey delivering a, pro, a product, as long as that's working the way I expect, any issues they have at that point are theirs to fix. So as long as I provide them the tools not to fail, and when you generate something with an auto package, you generally get predictable results, right? That's the whole benefit of using auto package. You get the same package info, the same structure every single time. So the, the possibility of error due to someone fine tuning or hand, you know, or, or hand editing things really drops down a lot. So as long as you're linting that for the proper results, um, that has reduced like almost all the issues we have. Nearly all the issues we have now are people not understanding how versions work. The numbers have to go up, not down. <laughs> this is hard, but the numbers have to go up. And trailing spaces, God's gift to mankind. Okay, thank you very much.